Uh, Joan is on the faculty at the Department of Cell Biology at Harvard Medical School, where she's been since 1997. Uh, she's the chairman of that department, or the chairperson of that department. Uh, Joan has a very long and distinguished history. I won't go through all of it, except to say that she's held full professorships at uh, uh, State University of New York, Stony Brook, and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she dropped out of academia for a while in order to found Ariad Pharmaceuticals, then came back. Uh, she's been instrumental in so many areas of, of uh, cell signaling and cell biology. Um, we could spend half the day going through them. She discovered SAR um, kinase as a, a viral oncogene when she was a postdoc. Um, and, and her work has primarily touched on, on a couple different areas, mostly cell proliferation, survival, and migration. And more recently, it's been the, uh, the, the fusion of sort of uh, cell migration and attachment and drug resistance. And the title of her talk today is Matrix-Dependent Rewiring of Signaling Pathways Following Targeted, targeted Therapies. Thank you, Mike. So while all of you were enjoying this morning's session, I was in PowerPoint hell um, <laughs> due to a corrupted file that hung up PowerPoint for the last five hours or something like that, including last night. And so I had to madly transfer everything, put together a talk from many, many different pieces. And so this is kind of serves as a, as a disclaimer should um, that should there be any kind of disasters or it not be as smooth as I would hope it to, would be. Okay, so today um, I'm going to describe some studies that led us down a somewhat unexpected path that's raised some interesting questions um, with respect to the context-dependent differences in the response to perturbations of signaling pathways in normal cells and tumor cells. And the person who really initiated these studies and led to us ra <clears throat> raising these questions was Taru Moranen, who's a postdoc in the lab, who's also in the audience. Um, and basically, she was interested in examining the effects of inhibition of one of the major um, oncogene pathways in ovarian tumor cells. And she um, wanted to do this in a three-dimensional context in order for the cells to be organized into structures that, three-dimensional structures that more closely resembled the organization of tumors in vivo. And one reason why she was particularly interested in the PI3 kinase pathway is that earlier studies in our lab had, <clears throat> um, where we were looking at morphogenesis of normal breast epithelial cells had shown that cells that were not that were unable to attach to extracellular matrix in the center of the structures underwent cell death. And we probed the reasons that this, these, the mechanisms involved in the cell death and found that there was a really dramatic induction of apoptosis in cells in the center of these structures. And interestingly, when we blocked apoptosis by overexpressing BCL2 or BCLXL, we found that the cells in the center still were cleared and underwent cell death. And what we learned from a whole series of studies was that um, the cells in the center of the structure, even if you blocked apoptosis, or there was a high level of autophagy, suggesting that the cells may be starved and upregulating up autophagy in order to eat themselves to provide nutrients for cell survival. And then Alex Grossian and Zach Schaefer showed a few years ago that cells in the center of the structures, or cells that were just deprived of matrix in general, were unable to transport glucose and amino acids into, into the cells and that there was a really dramatic drop in ATP in cells that were unable to attach to matrix. So essentially, these cells in the center were starving. So we had hypothesized that in tumor cells, in order for cells to be able to survive in niches where they were not as associated with their natural extracellular matrix, that the cells would have to be able to overcome or <clears throat> inhibit or block apoptosis induced under conditions when cells lose their attachment to matrix, but also be able to rescue this metabolic defect. And so we looked at signaling pathways or oncogene signaling pathways um, to see which ones were able to rescue these different phenotypes. And what we and others have found is that any of a number of um, oncogene pathways were able to block apoptosis when cells were detached from their natural matrices. So activation of ERK, PI3 kinase AKT, NF-kappa B, and others. However, interestingly, when, when Zach and Alex tested a whole variety of different oncogenes, they found that, in fact, only hyperactivation of the PI3 kinase pathway was able to rescue the metabolic impairment. And what they found was that <clears throat> in cells that are attached to matrix, that you need integrant engagement by, 
with its extracellular matrix proteins in order to facilitate really efficient transduction of signals that activate the downstream pathways that are um, induced by activation of receptor tyrosine kinases like EGF receptor. And that under conditions in which cells lose their attachment to matrix, there's a very dramatic block in the transduction of signals from the EGF receptor. So, <clears throat> so under these conditions, there's a block in activation of, of the ras erc pathway as well as PI3 kinase and RAC. Now, under conditions in which you introduce an activated variant of PI3 kinase, like the mutant forms of PI3 kinase that are commonly associated with tumors, there's, um, these, under these conditions, um, the cells are able to transport glucose and glutamine even when they're held in suspension. So the activation of PI3 kinase abrogates the need for attachment to matrix in order to transport glucose and um, glutamine. So we think that this is one reason why the PI3 kinase pathway is so commonly altered in cancer, because not only can it prevent apoptosis under a variety of different conditions in which cells are stressed, but also it can rescue this metabolic impairment. We also, um, Alex and Zach also showed that hyperactivation of receptor tyrosine kinase pathways or the RAS pathway leads to constitutive activation of PI3 kinase and also rescues the um, transport of glucose and um, amino acids under these conditions. Okay, so that's why we were particularly interested in looking at the, per the effects of perturbation of the PI3 kinase pathway in this three-dimensional context. Okay, so the prediction was that survival of human tumor cells outside of matrix environments would be dependent on the PI3 kinase pathway. So that's going back to the beginning, the first slide. So Taru um, first um, incubated a whole variety of different ovarian tumor cell lines in um, Matrigel to form these three-dimensional spheroid structures, and then waited four days, and after they had formed the structure, she treated with PI3 kinase inhibitors, and then later she also expanded this to breast cultures as well. Okay, so basically what, what Taru found was that there was very little um, difference between the cells that, oh, so the first drug that she used was a combined inhibitor that Novartis has generated that hits both the PI3 kinase and M mTOR kinases. And there's very little, she saw very little change in the overall morphology of the structures, although the, after treatment, the cells treated with BEZ were unable to proliferate and get larger. However, when she looked inside, she found that the cells in the center of the structures were actually undergoing apoptosis when she used an antibody against caspase 3 to monitor apoptosis. So basically, um, it looked as if the cells in the center of the structure were hypersensitive to inhibition of PI3 kinase. And then she also looked at a whole variety of other inhibitors that had different ac differential activity against different components of this pathway and found, in fact, that inhibition of any of them led to death, selective death of the cells in the center of the structure. So why are these cells on the outside so resistant to PI3 kinase inhibition? And my guess was that they were resistant because when attached to matrix, they were activating multiple pathways that were anti-apoptotic, and so loss of one wouldn't have a significant impact. However, the other possibility was that inhibition of the PI3 kinase pathway would lead to an induction of a survival program that would selectively allow the matrix-attached cells to survive. So um, in order to address this, we wanted to look at whether there were what kind of changes in signaling pathways occurred after treatment with the PI3 kinase um, inhibitors. And so we collaborated with Gordon Mills and Yiling Liu, who've developed this ART reverse phase protein arrays. So basically, they're able to monitor the level of expression or the level of phosphor phosphopeptides, uh, phosphorylated proteins, for a whole variety of different proteins. So in the initial analysis, um, we provided them with lysates from the uh, vehicle treated or, or B DMSO treated or BEZ treated. Um, tumor cell lines that were treated in 3D culture and then looked at differences that were induced by treatment with the PI3 kinase inhibitor. And the way this is visualized is that anything red, all the data was normalized to the um, DMSO control, so anything red the, were proteins or phosphoprotein signals that were upregulated and green is downregulated. And what we found is that the inhibitor worked really well, not surprisingly, but that there was a huge program of proteins or phosphoproteins that were upregulated. <laughs> and when we looked at these more closely, found that, in fact, multiple receptor tyrosine kinases showed increased phosphorylation, as well as downstream proteins, proteins that are downstream from these, like RISC and phosphostat, 
but that also there was, were anti-apoptotic proteins like BCL2 and XIP, which is a caspase inhibitor. So these results suggest that the second scenario was true, that when cells are attached to matrix, they're able to adapt to this insult of inhibition of the PI3 kinase pathway, which is so important for survival and metabolic impairment, and that this could be responsible for the um, survival of the matrix-attached cells. And this just shows um, analysis of five different breast tumor cell lines, and basically they saw um, Karu and Devin Worcester, who was a student that was working with her um, before he went to med school. Um, saw the same similar pattern, inhibition of expected proteins and then upregulation of a whole set of different proteins, which you can see more closely here. We saw the same, similar kind of thing, BCL2. In this case, we saw BCLXL in most of the cell lines as well. Um, one thing interesting was that we saw differential upregulation of the ERK pathway. So you can see that in two of the lines, there was no activation. In fact, there was a downregulation of ERK phosphorylation whereas in others there was an upregulation. And I'll get back to this later because we were wondering whether this would predict sensitivity to combined inhibition of ERK inhibitors with PI3 kinase inhibitors. So basically this pattern seemed to hold true. Um, what I've shown you from the RPPA is really only the tip of the iceberg. One thing that we, um, Taru got, uh, analyzed messenger RNA levels or levels of expression of genes in cells that were treated with BEZ. And this just shows cytokine and cytokine receptor gene ontology groups and shows the proteins that were upregulated or genes that were, uh, or RNA that were upregulated with BEZ at 6 and 12 hours. And you can see there are multiple cytokine, cytokine receptors that were upregulated as well. So there's kind of an explosion that takes place after you make the, have, and whether you, when you insult the cells so significantly with these PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitors. Okay, so basically, treat, then, just to recap, treatment with PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor leads to both death of the inner cells as well as upregulation of a whole series of different proteins. So this raised the question, or, so, okay, so, so around the same time over the last two years, based a whole set of different labs, and there's actually more now, this was, this is about six months old, a number of different labs have shown that under conditions of inhibition of either receptor tyrosine kinases or PI3 kinase or AKT, that there's an upregulation of receptor tyrosine kinases. So this adaptive response um, is, has, is very well established now um, and something that is important to think about in terms of understanding how we can make more effective um, anti-cancer inhibitors. So one of the questions that Taru was interested in asking is what is the mechanism that's responsible for upregulation of all these different proteins and phosphoproteins? And just kind of at a 100,000-foot level, the data that she has as well as data from those groups that I just showed you before um, indicate that when <clears throat> inhibition of PI3 kinase and mTOR leads to suppression of feedback inhibition pathways. So under conditions in which cells are activated by receptor tyrosine kinases, a whole variety of different effectors are turned on, and a subset of those actually come back and feedback, inhibit the pathway to keep it under control so that it's not constitutively out of control. So um, many of the proteins and <clears throat> messenger RNAs that we see upregulated are due to this type of suppression of the normal feedback inhibition. So if you block this feedback inhibition, then you can get activation of these pathways. And then what Taru found is that under conditions in which the mTOR pathway is, is inactivated, mTOR controls proteins, cap-dependent protein synthesis, that you, she also, that a subset of the proteins that showed increased translation were um, translated through a cap-independent translation mechanism. So we have both two different mechanisms going on under conditions in which both PI3 kinase and mTOR are inhibited. Just to show you that in a little bit more detail, so under, <clears throat> one of the major feedback inhibition pathways that contributes to this program is the FOXO transcription factors. So these are normally held in the cytoplasm by phosphorylation of AKT. So under conditions where AKT is inhibited, you get a translocation of FOXO into the nucleus and transcription of FOXO targets, and m multiple receptor tyrosine kinases are upregulated at the transcriptional level. However, under conditions in which mTOR is inhibited, there's an inhibition of cap-dependent translation. So how are these proteins translated? We saw an increase in the protein levels as well as the RNA levels. Um, okay, so because you have this inhibition, what's going on? In addition, 
Under conditions in which P3P kinase was inhibited, as I showed you before, there's a really significant decrease in amino acid and glucose uptake. And under these conditions, it was known that there's an inhibition of the initiation of translation through phosphorylation of initiation factor EIF2. So under these conditions, so we asked whether under these conditions there was an increase in phosphoEIF2, and Taru actually saw a really dramatic increase in this. So not only were we blocking the mTOR regulation of cap-dependent translation, but also there was a generalized inhibition of initiation. However, it's been shown by others that under conditions in which there's inhibition of initiation, that cap-independent um, messenger RNAs are more are preferentially translated. So Taru actually did a whole series of different experiments, which were published, so I'm just summarizing, to look at whether internal ribosome um, entry sites, which allow cap-independent translation, were um, upregulated. And basically what she found is that there was an increase in cap-independent translation under these conditions, and that many of the proteins that showed um, upregulation contained either known um, and well-documented iris internal ribosome entry site sequences or um, um, consensus sequences that, that corresponded to known um, iris sequences. So again, this kind of provides some detail to how these, how this inhibition of these pathways can lead to upregulation of so many different proteins. Okay, so those of you who work um, in lower eukaryotic organisms like fly and worm probably recognize this pathway. Interestingly, almost exactly the same type of mechanism occurs in flies and worms under conditions in which they're deprived of nutrients and growth factors. So in order for these organisms to survive this insult of loss of nutrients or growth factor receptors, they activate almost identical program. So when you think about it, basically the um, <clears throat> tumor cells are using a very well-conserved pathway that's been evolved over millions of years <clears throat> in order to allow organisms to be able to survive under conditions of stress. So basically this is what we're dealing with in, 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 in attempts to make, to, um, to utilize PI3 kinase inhibitors for treatment of breast cancer, so, or treatment of cancers in which the, this pathway is upregulated. So basically we have to abrogate <clears throat> this response in order for the <clears throat> inhibition to be more effective. Okay, so one thing interesting that Toru was um, interested in looking at was whether under conditions in which a normal mouse was starved, <clears throat> would there be a similar upregulation of anti-apoptotic proteins and growth factor receptors. And she collaborated with Nadja Kalani, who had started um, the work on calorie restriction when she was a postdoc with David Sabatini's lab, in David Sabatini's lab. And basically what she found is that if she looked at BCLXL in this case, there was high level induction of um, BCLXL in both the epithelial cells and in the fat cells. And when, um, by blot, she also saw this upregulation of EGF, EGF receptor and IGF receptor and the expected loss of um, phosphor, uh, the mTOR target um, S6, as shown by David and others. So basically, it looks like normal cells, not surprising given what I just said about flies and worms, also undergo this response. Okay, so then, <clears throat> then these results raise the question whether inhibition of any of these proteins that were upregulated would, um, would compromise the, or would lead to would abrogate this survival response. And so Taru started by inhibiting or treating these um, PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor treated structures with a P BCL2 inhibitor. And we started with an inhibitor that was developed by Steve Fessick at Abbott. So what would happen if you block BCL2 um, as well as PI3 kinase? And what she found was that there's a really dramatic inhibition uh, or induction of cell death of the outer cells as well as the inner cells. So inhibition of that one component that was upregulated led to death of the um, cells, of the outer cells as well as the inner cells. Um, another question is what about if you blocked any of these other ones? And Taru's looked at a couple of them, just show you EGF receptor. So if you block EGF receptor, she used two different EGF receptor inhibitors. In the OV2008 cells, she saw a very similar um, inhibition or <clears throat> synthetic lethality where treatment with both of the inhibitors led to almost complete dissolution or destruction of the cells and the structures. So would in inhibition of any major signaling pathway lead to this response? And one thing that, um, one thing that she did was to treat with an ERK inhibitor since ERK controls apoptosis in so many different cell types. And what she found is that inhibition of ERK in the context of PI3 kinase inhibitor did not show any 
um, synthetic lethality or cooperativity. So basically, there was no additional death when she treated these cells with an, with an ERK inhibitor. So in these cells, we did not see upregulation of ERK. So at least in that, for this one inhibitor, the, the an inhibition, or for this one pathway inhibition, uh, if the pathway wasn't activated, we didn't see this synthetic lethality. Okay, so then basically, um, this kind of, I think everyone in the field who kind of follows this, these pathways is thinking about whether we could, um, whether <clears throat> we could actually use approaches like this to develop rational strategies for combination therapies. So what I've shown you is that blocking critical signaling nodes rewires signaling pathways and that these wired networks contribute to the resistance of targeted therapies. And so are these um, induced pathways then vulnerabilities of the tumor cells that could be exploited for um, cancer therapy? And so, um, so then the ration, the, what could potentially one could imagine is that, the, that patients' uh, samples would be treated or tumor cells would be treated with the inhibitor. You then analyze the adaptive response players and then specifically target those adaptive response players that are critical for survival in the context of the original inhibitor. And Taru, as well as Gordon Mills' as lab, has been just investigating this somewhat to see if you could predict the combination therapies that would be effective by looking at which ones were upregulated. So I showed you before that in OV2008, the ERK pathway wasn't activated and there was no synthetic lethality with the, with the MEK inhibitor. So MCAS cells is another um, breast uh, ovarian tumor cell line. In this case, she saw, Taru saw really um, a strong induction of the ERK pathway. So would combined therapy with a MEK inhibitor and, P and the BEZ be effective in these cells? And basically what she found, this is just looking at percent survival with individual drug alone. There's essentially almost no um, uh, cell killing, but with two different MEK inhibitors in combination. In this cell line, there was just almost complete uh, killing of the cells. So basically it looks in this particular example that, um, that there was a prediction. So. Uh, Gordon is looking at a whole lot of other ones. This is actually data from his lab, just shows a few examples. So um, this is a breast tumor cell line that um, he treated either with a PI3 kinase inhibitor or a HER2 inhibitor. And just showing here that in the PI3 kinase inhibitor showed an induction of um, STAT phosphorylation, which is mediated by the JAK kinase. And what he found is that inhibition of either of JAK or PI3 kinase inhibited proliferation but didn't cause killing. However, when he combined a JAK inhibitor with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, that caused the synthetic lethality. And interesting, lapatinib, which did not induce phosphostat, there was no, there was no um, effect of the combined treatment of lapatinib and the JAK inhibitor. And then similarly, we saw something similar with an AKT inhibitor. AKT induced phosphostat, and you see synthetic lethality. So he's actually done this for lots and lots of different cell lines and um, inhibitors. And basically, he, what he has found is somewhere between 75 and 85, in 75 to 80 percent of the cases, the upregulation of a protein will, or phosphoprotein or pathway will predict the sensitivity to combined inhibition. So I think it's a really um, feasible to start thinking about this kind of strategy to rationally design their um, inhibitors. Okay. so. Um, so then I just want to finish by showing you addressing whether this adaptive response is observed in vivo and would combination <coughs> therapies be effective in, in an in vivo setting. So I'm just going to show you a couple different things that, that Taru as well as Jason, a postdoc in the lab, Jason Zeller, a postdoc in the lab, have done. So Taru just did um, used one model in which there, you get very rapid tumor formation after subcutaneous injection of two different um, PI3 kinase inhibitors. And what she found is that combined inhibition of PI3 of a BCL2 as well as a PI3 kinase inhibitor. In this case, we used a PI3 kinase inhibitor from Genentech because they're co-developing the Abbott BCL2 inhibitors. So this is a PI GNE um, <clears throat> uh, 493 is a um, combined PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor. So PI3 kinase inhibition re retarded the growth of the tumors, but there was a much more dramatic um, a reduction in tumor growth with the combined inhibition. And when you look in, at the histology, you see very dramatically this induction of toxicity, a much stronger toxicity in, with the combined inhibitor. So this was interesting. Um, and then, oh, sorry, uh, I guess I didn't get that slide in. She also saw upregulation of, of BCL2 
an IGF receptor, an EGF receptor in this in these um, in these um, tumors in vivo as well. So basically, this kind of showed that you could get the synthetic lethality, but these tumors don't really, there's no context really to look at whether at the matrix, um, uh, whether matrix is influencing this adaptive response. And so we switched to a model um, in which we could get a much, where the architecture of the tumor is better defined and we could distinguish matrix-associated tumor cells from non-matrix-associated tumor cells. And to do this, we used a, um, injected tumor cells into the nipple that was, for, was reported recently by da in Dan Medina's lab. Um, under these conditions, certain um, tumor cells will make these carcinoma in situ-like structures. So this is a carcinoma in situ um, that's induced by a HER2 positive SUM225 um, breast tumor cell line. You can see it looks very similar to HER2 positive carcinoma in situ in, the, in humans. Basically, um, these tumor cells are surrounded by an extracellular matrix coat, coating. So the question was, if you treated these cells with a HER2 inhibitor, would there be differential sensitivity to the HER2 inhibitor? So what she did was to, uh, I mean, what J Jason did was to treat the animals with lapatinib or vehicle, and then after a number of days, look at the um, cell killing. And we got, we were... So this is just vehicle alone. We didn't really see any induction of cell death. Um, and this is um, after a few days of treatment. What you see are these crypts of dying cells that are kind of randomly throughout the structure. However, we, didn't, we noticed that there were, we didn't see any killing of the outer cells, which is where the dose of the drug is the highest, since the blood vessels are all outside of these structures. And then at, in a, another set of cells, so about a third of the cell lines show much more dramatic induction of killing. So basically all the tumor cells died except, as you can see here, the outer cells. So this is highly reproducible. We can treat for much longer periods of time and this outer layer of cells is, is highly resistant. So this was really surprising because it looked very similar to what we had seen in vivo. We kind of didn't expect to see that. Um, we also, he also did, our, our uh, Gordon Mills also performed reverse phase protein arrays on cells, on the tumor cells after five or ten days of treatment and found a similar upregulation of growth factor receptors in BCL2, BCLXL. So this allowed us to address the question whether um, all the cells show this adaptive response in vivo or whether just the cells that are showing the protective protection from the treatment with the drug. <laughs> this is treatment, I mean this is ex um, uh, analysis of BCL2 expression using a human specific BCL2 antibody in the tumor cells um, that were treated with vehicle. So basically there's low levels of BCL2 expressed. And then this is in the cells treated with lapatinib. And you can see a very dramatic upregulation of BCL2 and it's strongly enriched in these outer cells. So it looks like even in vivo that the um, upregulation of, this, of the, this adaptive response, at least monitored by this one particular protein, BCL2, seems to be confined to those cells on the outside of these structures which are in association with both matrix as well as um, um, other stromal cells. So basically, um, our, the model that we would propose then is that under conditions of, of uh, inhibition of um, PI3 kinase pathway, either through direct PI3 kinase inhibition or lapatinib, which inhibits both PI3 kinase and mTOR, that we get a selective sur survival or induction of death of the cells in the center of these structures, um, whereas the outer cells are protected. And what we found, and I didn't have time to show you, is that these outer cells in the lapatinib-treated samples are able to proliferate. So basically, you have a situation where this, you kind of have a festering tumor. Cells can proliferate, but basically they can't expand because under conditions where the drug is still present, they'll die as soon as they lose that protective influence uh, that's pr present in this outer layer of the tumor cells. And that we would propose under conditions in which you could have these proliferating cells, this would provide the opportunity for secondary alterations that would then allow the cells to um, survive and proliferate without the matrix attachment due to more stable genetic or epigenetic changes and that this could be one mechanism for relapse. So basically you kind of have a protected niche of cells under conditions of the treatment and this could um, either lead to regrowth of the tumors after release of the drug or in the presence of the drug lead to select for, allow further selection through because these cells can proliferate for additional genetic and epigenetic changes.
I think so. And so obviously what we're trying to do, and um, I think others are thinking along the same lines, is we need to figure out how to kill these protected cells. So we're, we're using um, combination therapies of BCL2 plus lipatinib and um, PF3 kinase inhibitors, like I showed you already, um, to try to, f to develop optimal conditions for abrogating this protective influence. And I just wanted to show you one other slide that um, these are some tumors that Gerborg Wolf gave Taru to stain with an antibody against um, BCL2. And basically, these are tumors that develop in the background of the BRCA and P53 um, mutant mice. So basically, they're, they're developing um, through a more natural situ condition where tumor, two tumor suppressors are abrogated. And what Taru found is that the pushing, at the pushing margins of these tumors is where she saw the highest level of BCL2 upregulated. In addition, she also see it saw it upregulated in the normal structures. So again, suggesting that this upregulation of this pathway in this context as well is dependent on matrix. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think what, what think what we're interested in looking at the future in the future is really understanding what the basis for this matrix protection is, as well as figuring out how to abrogate it. And I just wanted to acknowledge the um, people as well as the funding agencies that were involved in um, supporting our work. I think I mentioned everyone here except for Laura. Laura was the bioinformaticist who first did the um, visualization of the data and showed the um, induction of the adaptive response. So this particular work was supported by the Adelson Medical Research Foundation as well as um, the National Cancer Institute. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Time for one question. Go ahead. I'll stand up. Um, so you have the adaptive response where you treat with the drug and you see in your system that you have adaptive response, so you go back and start from the beginning and add two drugs. So if you treat with the drug, let the tumor or cell grow for a while, and then treat with your neck inhibitor, do you see the same type of response by the two drugs? Because when you have a patient, you wouldn't expect to a priori know what that, um, yes. that second lesion is. Right, what right. Um, so what Taru hasn't done the MEK inhibitor, but she has done a um, treatment with PI3 kinase inhibitor for seven days, and then three days after three, I mean, after seven days, she added the um, uh, BCL2 inhibitor for three days. And she got essentially as equally as effective of killing as she had gotten with combined treatment with both of them. So, so I think in certain contexts that might be feasible, and that might be really good because the BI3, the BCL2 inhibitors um, show toxicity because platelets require, are dependent on BCL-XL. So Abbott's just developed a new BCL2-specific drug that doesn't uh, um, target BCL-XL. So those might be more efficient. But I think, you know, this the idea of pulsing in the second inhibitor might be a good way to avoid some of the toxicities of the combined inhibition.